Good morning, everyone. It is very good to have everyone here this morning. It's time that we get ready for our Bible class. Uh, our good brother David is having a bad morning today, so he's not going to be able to be here. And uh, we're going to have a, a video presentation for our Bible class this morning. Uh, brother Ken Curry will be speaking at the hour, at the morning hour of worship, and Dalton will be speaking tonight. So let's be sure and keep David in our prayers as we do that. And uh, Lee is going to start us up a video here. And again, we're, we're very thankful. If you would, uh, bow with me. We'll have a prayer before we get started. I, I pulled a fast one on Lee. Let's have a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for today and every blessing that we have. Father, we can see your hand in the changing of the weather and the changing of the seasons. And we're so thankful that you let your presence be known to us. Father, as we go into this Bible class hour this morning, we pray that you'll help us have open minds and hearts and that that we will draw closer to you. And we will do so in a diligent manner and that we'll take uh, an active part in, in learning and being part of this worship and learning service this morning. Father, we bring before you the name of David Payton this morning. We know that he is having a bad day and we, we pray for him. We pray that you will strengthen him, strengthen his body and the medications that are, that are being prescribed for him, that they will, they will be beneficial to him. Father, help us all to be an encouragement to each other we ask this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Be the glory. Hi, my name is Bill Watkins. I really appreciate the opportunity to come to you and offer to you something from Scripture that I believe will change our lives for the better. In Scripture, we have the absolute Word of God. It is the message from God's heart to my heart and to yours. And it strikes me that right now, especially in times like this, we need that Word more than ever. We need hope. In a time where COVID-19 has covered the world, in a time where the economic situation of the world has suffered, in a time where many, many people are isolated from one another, we need hope more than ever. It's to hope that Paul speaks in Romans chapter 15. He says in verse 12 of Romans chapter 15, in him will the Gentiles hope. But then he says this amazing prayer in verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. We all have situations that just don't seem like they're possibly going to work out. We don't know when we're ever going to get well. We don't know when the economic situation is going to change for us. There are times we look at our family and we say, they're so fractured and divided. How in the world can I ever bring that family back together again? We don't see how it can happen. And all our circumstances seem to say it's never going to happen. The circumstances say you can't do it. God's not going to come through. But you and I abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to have hope. It's another thing to abound in hope. <clears throat> the word that he uses here is an interesting Greek word when he talks about abound. It means to superabound. It means to excel. It means to overflow. It means to have more than enough. You and I not only need to hope, but we need to abound in hope. We need to overflow in hope. We need to have an excess of hope. And when you abound in hope, then you're not moved when the circumstances don't look like they can possibly work out. If you abound in hope, you're not discouraged just because things haven't changed yet. You thought that they would, they haven't changed yet, you're still praying. If you're abounding in hope, then you're not worried because you don't see a way that anything can possibly work out. You're abounding in hope because you know that the Lord reigns over the nations. He sits on his holy throne. That's Psalm 47, verse 8. You abound in hope because you know that a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. 
And the Lord is ordering your steps if you're a child of God. You know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And you love God and you're called according to his purpose. By the way, that was Romans chapter 8, verse 28. You know his promises that he's made. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, remember he told Joshua, be strong and courageous. He says, do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And he's with you. He's with you right now if you're his child. In Psalm 37, verses 4 and 5, Delight also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him, and he will bring it to pass. You believe that promise. Or from Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he will not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. You may have gone through difficult times, but you are not going to ultimately fail. Why? You're in the hands of God. And God himself has promised that you will not ultimately fail. You believe in the promise of Isaiah chapter 41 verse 3, where God said, I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying, Fear not, I will help you. Or Psalm 32 verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. How about this one? Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9. Know that the Lord your God, he is God. The faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Or Proverbs chapter 2 verses 6 and 7. The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. Maybe one more. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. You and I have a promise. We have more than a promise. We have abundant promises, and so we abound in hope. And that means that we can't be talked out of our hope. The odds are against us. What are the odds? The odds have nothing to do with my God. I'll not stop believing. You don't see a way, but you keep thanking God because he's making a way. We have hope. People tell you it's not going to happen. You just might as well accept it. This is the way that life is. That life is hard and then you die. And you just let that go in one ear and go out the other, because we're confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in us will complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus. That's Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. What God has started in you, he's going to finish. You need to have that kind of confidence. When we're suffering with COVID-19 or any other illness, we abound in hope. When necessity isolates us from the people that we long to be with, we abound in hope. When the economy is affected by the world problems, we abound in hope. When we feel lonely, when we need someone to share our lives, we abound in hope. When we go through disappointment and hurt and difficulty, we could get discouraged. We could turn bitter. We could be despairing. We could be upset. But when you abound in hope, you do that because you know something that Joseph knew long ago and said in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Whatever the circumstance of your life is and whatever Satan would like to take away from you, I want you to know that while Satan means it to harm you, God takes that very same thing and he brings it in to bless you. What was meant for harm. God is turning to your advantage, and it's because you're a child of God, and you abound in hope. You may be sorrowful, but you abound in hope because you know that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. So my question really right now is, what are you abounding in? Are you abounding in worry? Like, what if it doesn't work out? Are you abounding in doubt? I don't see how this problem could ever be solved. Are you abounding in discouragement? 
It's been too long and the challenge has been too great and habits have gotten too deeply ingrained. If that's what you're abounding in, you're abounding in the wrong thing. If you start abounding in hope, despite what things look like, you'll be thanking God when you could be complaining. You'll be praising God, expecting things to change in your favor. And when you do that, you're going to see God do wonderful things in your life. God's looking for people to be abounding in hope. Problems that look permanent for you, those problems are only temporary. Let the experts say what they will. God will always have the last say. Trust God in this. You can't see how God is going to bless you. But the God you serve is the one who already placed a bitter tree or a tree beside bitter water so that the waters would turn sweet when you go over to Exodus chapter 15. The God that you serve knows that when the children of Israel were desperate for water, he had already put a rock in Horeb, and water was going to gush out of that rock. He had already taken care of that. When you're going through whatever it is that seems hopeless to you, God's already seen that. He knows everything, past, present, and future. And he's already made a way for you, even though you might not be able to see it yet, even though you don't know it. God's already lined up opportunities for you. He's already put people in your path that are going to help you on the way. They're coming. Trust Him. Abound in hope for every promise that God has ever made. He has a way of making that happen. So have the faith of the Father of the faithful. I want to read to you from Romans chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. It's talking about Abraham. God has appeared to Abraham and said, I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham. You're going to be the father of many nations. Now, Abraham is over 75 years old. His wife is barren. She's never been able to have children at all. And God said, you're going to have a child. And through that child, all the nations will be blessed. So how does Abraham respond to that? Listen, verses 20 and 21. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. What does it say about Abraham? He was fully convinced. It's one thing to be convinced. It's another thing to be fully convinced. It's one thing to live in hope. It's another thing to live abounding in hope. Abraham was fully convinced. What does that mean? It means that you're not going to change your mind. It means that you're not going to let people talk you out of it. It means that you're not going to let circumstances cause you to quit believing. So before you ever see the promise fulfilled, before anything has changed at all, there's a waiting period when you don't see anything happening. During that waiting period, there's no sign that there's anything that's ever going to change. And every thought will want to tell you you're wasting your time. Every thought wants to tell you, just accept it. Nothing is going to change. What I want you to remember is, this is a test. God wants to see, and he wants to show you what you're made of. Will you be fully convinced? Will you abound in hope? Or are you going to get talked out of your hope? Are are you going to give up? Are you going to dig really deep down into your soul and say, I'm not moved by what's not changing? I'm not discouraged because it's taking so long. I'm not worried because nothing is improving. I'm not worried because I know that God is a faithful God. I've seen him bless his people in the past. I've read about it in the scripture. I've seen it in my life. I've seen him bless me in my past, and I have all confidence. I am fully convinced and abounding in hope that God is going to bless me in the future. That's what Abraham did. God gave him the promise and said he was going to have a baby when he just can't do it. He looked at Sarah and he says, her womb is as good as dead. It says of Abraham, he was as good as dead. What a prognosis. And yet when God made a promise, he didn't stop because it looked impossible. He didn't quit dreaming because the dream seemed to be too big. He didn't say, I'm not going to believe this because it just doesn't make sense for a guy my age. He didn't because... He was fully convinced. He didn't because he was abounding in hope. 
And some of you need to abound in hope again and stop trying to just huddle up and hope that your life will survive COVID-19 or hope that you survive whatever negative circumstances you're going through right now and begin to believe that God's already lined up blessing for you. There are some people that I know who say, I, I, I don't think I ought to go to college right now. Times are just too tough. Go to college. There are some who say, I, I, I don't know whether I should start this business right now. And I don't know whether it should go. Maybe I don't have enough experience. I just don't know. Don't let your doubts be the thing that stops you. Somebody says, I'm so limited. My problems are so enormous. The world is so big and I'm so small. I feel like David versus Goliath. Well, that's fine. Just remember who won that battle. It was David that won that battle. Now, here's the key to abounding in hope. God does not ask us to figure it all out. He doesn't ask us to come up with a plan and research it and decide whether or not it's possible for God to do what God has promised. He simply asks us to believe. He asks us to step out, to abound in hope. Look at verse 21 again of Romans 4. Abraham was fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. I need to have that same fully convinced attitude. I need to be able to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. I am fully convinced that God has opened a door that no one can shut. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I am confident in this very thing that he who has begun a good work in me will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I'm fully persuaded that I will impact this world for good that I will leave my mark, that through Christ I will be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And I will let my light so shine before men that they may see my good works and glorify my Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Those promises of God may seem unlikely. You don't see how it can happen. You could easily talk yourself out of it. You could talk yourself out of believing. You can talk yourself out of stepping out in faith. Don't do that. Don't do that. What I want you to do instead is to trust God here, to abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Like Abraham, you can say, I am fully convinced that what God has promised, he is able also to perform. God, I believe you're going to keep your promises, not just to the world in general. I believe you're going to keep them to me personally and individually. I believe that you've made a promise to me. And I believe that that promise is one that you're going to keep. Now, you may not see any sign that that's happening. You may have no physical reason outside of yourself in your circumstances to believe that. But that's what it means to abound in hope. It's not abounding primarily in your logic, in your reasoning, which seems to say it's just not possible. But down in your spirit, down in your heart where you really live, you have this expectancy. You have this passion. You have this knowing that God's going to do something out of the ordinary, something that you couldn't make happen on your own, but he can make it happen. He's made the promise. Thoughts will tell you it's impossible. Why are you still believing? You know that the problem's not going to work out. The same thoughts had to come to Abraham. You can't have a baby. You're too old. Sarah's way past childbearing, and she's never been able to have children anyway. So what did Abraham do? I want you to look at verse 18 of Romans chapter 4. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. I like that. Against hope, he hoped. Even when it seemed impossible to hope, he said, I will hope anyway. When it doesn't look hopeful, when it doesn't seem possible, when it doesn't seem that anything can happen, when it says to myself, when I say to myself, I feel like I'm wasting my time, dig down deep. And against hope, believe in hope. Against hope, keep hoping. Against all odds, dare to believe. Dare to hope. When the world tells you one thing and God tells you something else, you keep hoping in faith. When things look impossible, I want to remember that God says, with God, all things are possible. Mark chapter 10, verse 27. Listen to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 24. Lord of hosts has sworn, 
As I have planned, so shall it be. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. When you feel alone, remember Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. I need to remember that I'm not alone. I need to remember that God is in control. What are you fully convinced of? It's not just enough to be convinced. But you need to have a made-up mind. I am going to trust God. I am going to hope in God. I am fully convinced that what God has promised, He's able to perform. Giving up is not an option for me. Not believing is not something I'll even consider. My face is set, and I won't be changed by negative reports, and I won't be stopped by how impossible a thing looks, and I won't be complaining because of how long it seems to be taken. You know, God has promised, and God's promise is on the way. Whatever God has promised, that promise is on the way. There might be a time of waiting, but that promise is on the way. Abraham had all kinds of times where he could have stopped believing. God gave him the promise and nothing happened. Year after year went by and still nothing happened. No sign of a baby. And the whole time he's getting older. The whole time Sarah's getting older. What seemed impossible at first seems even more impossible now. Listen to verse 19 of Romans chapter 4. But Abraham considered not the weakness of his own body, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. When you abound in hope, you're considering not your circumstances, but the power and promise of God. You're considering what it is that God has promised to us. If you stay focused on how big the problem is, on how the experts have said it's not going to work out, how impossible it looks, you're going to get discouraged. Quit considering your circumstances. Start considering your God. Remember who He is. Remember what He's done for His people. Remember what he's promised to do for you. No person can stop our God. There's no sickness, no bad break, no addiction that can stop God. God's going to do what God has promised to do. So are you considering how big your problems are or how big your God is? If I understand how big God is, it makes a difference. There's a translation of Romans chapter 14, verse 18 that I particularly like. It says, all human reason for hope was gone. But Abraham hoped on in faith. Maybe you feel like there's no reason for you to have hope. There's no reason for you to continue to believe. That if you look at what's natural, it's just not possible. But you and I serve a supernatural God. And he can make things happen that nobody else can happen and open doors that you and I have never seen. So Abraham is 100 years old now. Sarah is 90 years old now. It may be as many as 25 years from the promise that God made until it's fulfilled. But she gave birth to a son, and they named him Isaac. I want you to think about what that must be like. All the hoping, all of the praying, all of the trusting, and all of the ridicule that you know they had to receive by people when they said, we've got a promise from God that we're going to have a son. All of a sudden, it became clear that there is no problem too big. There is no depth of depression so deep that God can't lift you up. He can. He can bring you from where you are to where he wants you to be. So keep your whole hope stirred up. Be fully convinced. Abound in hope by the power of God. And that's what Paul was praying for. He prayed that you and I would abound in hope. That we would stay in faith even when it's taken a long time. That we would keep trusting even when the problem seems too big. That we wouldn't consider our circumstances, that instead we would consider our God. Listen to Psalm 55 verse 12. Excuse me, Psalm 5 verse 12. For you, O Lord God, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. I like what he said here. He didn't say, Lord, I hope you will bless the righteous. He didn't say, Lord, maybe you'll bless the righteous. He said, you will. Oh, Lord, you will bless the righteous. He was saying, I'm absolutely convinced. I'm fully persuaded that what you promised is on the way. 
In Psalm 23, in that favorite psalm that people have, in verse 6, he said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy. He had an assurance. You and I, we need some surely's in our life, don't we? That surely God is going to bless us. Not surely in the sense of a question, but God is sure to bless us. Surely God is here right now. In him we live and move and have our being. I know that God is here right now. I know that he holds the entire world in his hand. I'm sure of that. I'm sure that Jesus Christ is his son and that he ever lives to make intercession for us. I'm sure of that. There are some things I'm absolutely sure of. And so surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It's not maybe there's a good chance. Maybe if the medicine works. Maybe if I get that promotion. Maybe if people like me, I need to say surely. It's going to happen. God's going to bless me and his promises are going to be true no matter what my circumstances are right now. I'm confident that good things are coming. I'm confident that whatever the situation is, that it ultimately is turning around. I'm surely confident of that. Somebody says, but I don't see how it's going to happen. You don't have to. What you have to do is abound in hope. What you have to do is understand that God will give you through his spirit an overflowing of hope, an excessive amount of hope, more hope than you ever thought you would need. And all you have to do is be fully convinced. All you have to do is trust him. If you're a child of God, don't let your circumstances fool you. God's about to bless you. He's about to show you favor. And you didn't see it coming. In Psalm 27, David had all sorts of things against him. And if you read the psalm, you're going to find out that he had every opportunity to live discouraged, defeated, and without hope. He said in that psalm that his enemies were attacking him, that they were accusing him of things that he had never done. He said, they're lying about me, they're mean and violent, and on and on he goes about the things they were going to do. His life seems to be overflowing with trouble. But look at verse 13. Yet I am confident I will see the goodness of God. He said, all these negative things are happening to me, but there's one thing I'm absolutely confident of. I'm confident that God is here. I'm confident that God will deliver me. I'm confident that God will vindicate me. I'm confident that I will see his favor. He didn't deny that negative things were happening. He didn't live in a Pollyanna world. It's just that he didn't let it get on the inside. He didn't let him overwhelm him. I don't understand it. I was at my best. I was trying hard, God, and all these negative things happened. Why did these things happen? Doesn't that happen to us sometimes? Overflow with hope. God has a purpose behind everything that happens. In the middle of difficulties, when we don't see a way, when it doesn't seem fair, I'm asking you to overflow with hope. I'm reminded over in Numbers chapters 13 and 14 that God sent 12 men to spy out the land that he had promised the children of Israel. And while it was overflowing with milk and honey, there were those who came back and said, but there were giants in the land. And we look like grasshoppers to them and to us. They had walled cities, and it's just impossible. And the people listened to them, and they were discouraged. But I love Joshua and Caleb. Listen to what they said in chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. They spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into that land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord or fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. They had a surely mentality. They said, God is with us. We can take this land. They have no protection from God. God is with us. We know God is with us. As a result of that, we're not going to be afraid. Don't get talked out of your dreams just because it looks impossible. Don't get talked out of your hope just because there are giants all around you. And there are giants always that you're going to have to deal with. Just God is bigger than any giant in your life. He's bigger than any trouble in your life, any difficulty that you have. 
He's not limited by the environment. He's not limited by COVID-19. He's not limited by the economy. He's not limited by what you don't have. He's not limited by who's against you. He has all the power in the universe and he controls everything. Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus. Don't be a doubter. Doubters are a dime a dozen. There are people all over the world who've given up on their dreams, who've given up on hope, who thought that they could not make it. There are people all over the world who've been convinced that things can't work out. And some of them are some of the most intelligent people I know, and yet they still have this dark view of what the world is. But look at you. You're overflowing with hope. You're thanking God when you could be complaining. You're being good to people who aren't good to you because you know that God's going to reward you for that. You're believing when you don't see anything changing. You're talking about victory and declaring God's promises, and you have a song of praise in your heart. Why do you do that? You're overflowing with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You may take longer than you thought. Don't be talked out of it. Don't say, maybe it will happen. God has made promises, and those promises are real, and he will keep them. Never, ever, ever give up on your hope. It will make you joyful in the midst of pain. And it will give you vision when no one else can see in front of them. And it will give you a way when there is no possible way except through God. Abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks for watching. Got done a little early. We're thankful for you being here. We're going to have a short break. Uh, I will remind you, don't forget that we have picture taken today. There are a uh, place to sign up back there. That would be a good thing to do. Maybe this time, make sure that you're signed up to have your picture taken for the pictorial directory. And uh, Chloe's taking those pictures today. And I think we're going to skip next week because Chloe's going to be out of town. And then the week after, we'll start back. So make sure that you do that. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we'll be dismissed until the Lord's power.
Good morning, everyone. It sure is good to have everyone out this morning. I hope that you uh, turned the heat on last night. If not, you probably woke up in a cold house this morning. I think I think winter is upon us. It's uh, it's really it's really good to see the hand of God in the changing of the seasons. The, sometimes things come on fast. Just, just last week, I think Monday it was maybe eighty degrees, and now it was twenty uh, something this morning. So. There's definitely things at play. We are thankful that you're here. Our purpose here this morning, just like every Lord's Day, is to worship God and to honor Him. One of the great things about doing that is we also get to encourage each other, and it is very encouraging to see all your faces out here this morning. We are so thankful that you have chosen to be here with us. We do have several folks on our prayer list, and I'd like to give some updates and reminders and additions to make sure that you, uh, that you are up to date on that. Uh, David Payton did have his doctor's appointment this past Friday and they gave him a whole list of things to do. He's got some physical therapy and some medications and things like that. Uh, he is in a lot of pain this morning. He's not able to be here this morning. So we certainly need to keep David in our prayers. We certainly do. We are very thankful to have uh, men here at Lafayette that are able to fill in sometime at a moment's notice. And maybe sometimes at a little less than a moment's notice. But uh, we're thankful for Ken speaking this morning and Dalton. Uh, speaking this afternoon too, so this evening. But but do keep David Page in your prayers. Good to have Joyce Wright with us this morning. She had her MRI and she's going to go see the spine doctor on Thursday. So we need to keep her in our prayers as she has has that checkup. Uh, Debbie Dodson's still in the hospital and uh, doing some better. Uh, if things go well, she may get to come home today, I understand. So please continue yeah. to keep uh, Debbie in your prayers as well. Uh, Larry Jones is home from the hospital and I got word this morning that he is feeling a, a good bit better so please continue to pray for him as he as he uh, gets better and heals up. Ruth Crow had a bone density test uh, recently and is waiting on results for that so we need to keep our good sister Ruth in her prayers. Good to have Faye back with us. She had a little tumble and uh, she's a trooper. She's a trooper. It's so good to have her with us this morning. Julie Dodd has... Or, Tests scheduled for this week, and we want to pray that those tests give favorable results. So we're thankful uh, for Julie and hope that, that goes very well. Uh, Haley Jackson has an MRI scheduled this week on the 15th, so keep that in your prayers. Uh, Tony Lee, he's been having some continued health issues, and he told me this morning that he has surgery scheduled for November 30th. And they're going to uh, go in and replace a disc in his neck and uh, do some reconstructive work there. So it's pretty pretty uh, big surgery, so please keep Tony in your prayers as he, as he has that coming up. Uh, good to have Regina back with us this morning. She uh, had a, a bout with the flu, and she let it get completely gone, so she wouldn't share that with us, and we're thankful for that, but we're really thankful that you're able to be back with us, Regina. Need to continue to remember Joel Brumlow. He's been in the hospital with back problems. Keep him in your prayers. Keep Caitlin West in your prayers as she recovers from surgery. Also remember Tish Clark. And uh, Renita Brady. Renita has uh, has terminal cancer and she is on hospice care right now. So please keep her in your prayers. Added to our prayer list this morning is Cheryl Peters. Uh, Cheryl Peters is dealing with breast cancer and this is friend Diane Shields. We want to remember her. Also uh, Ginger Maxwell. Ginger is having a lot of lower back pain and think it may be a kidney stone again, but she's not real sure. So keep Ginger in your prayers. November is, is fleeting away, and uh, we've, we've been asking for folks to sign up if they can for a youth activity. We've got a little bit of time left for that, so if you're able to help with that, make sure that you uh, let someone know. Uh, there's a teen singing today in Trenton. Also, there's a sign-up sheet posted on the bulletin board for pictures for the church directory. I think uh, probably a lot of y'all have already gotten pictures taken. It's good. Uh, if you have any questions, you can talk to Jebby or Chloe. Chloe's taking the pictures. And uh, we want to get all these pictures taken. We want to have a pictorial directory so we can have a picture to look at and know, know a little bit more about who people are and what their addresses are so we can send cards and things like that. So we encourage everyone to, to please sign up uh, and ask questions if you have them. This Friday, the 18th, uh, there is a Thanksgiving singing at Fort Overcourt Congregation. So please uh, put that in the back of your mind. If you're able to be out on Friday, that would be a great thing to do. Good singing. 
We're also going to have a, a Thanksgiving service on Wednesday, November 23rd here. And David uh, Payton, he had some things that he was getting ready to hand out where the men are going to do some uh, song leading and prayers and scripture readings. And uh, it'll be a very good uh, before Thanksgiving service here in the faith. There is a box in the foyer for candy for the Christmas parade, so we'd encourage everyone that can to, to bring and donate for that. Our holiday party and gift exchange will be Sunday, December 4th, following morning worship. You can bring a gift uh, in the $8 to $12 range for ladies, men, or children if you plan on participating in that. Also, there are going to be gift baskets made up Sunday, December 11th, following evening worship. Uh, and those are going to be delivered on Monday the 12th. There's a sign-up sheet for that on the bulletin board in the back as well. There's a gospel meeting starting today at Berea, and Hugh Glaze will be speaking there. It'll go through the 16th. There's more information about that on the bulletin board. And also, just as a part of our security and health team update, there's a, an AED, an automated emergency defibrillator that we have, and it is going to be installed in the foyer to the nursery today. So it's going to be in its little case there. So if we have an emergency and somebody says, hey, go bring the AED, it's going to be in a in its little case in the nursery in the foyer there. So uh, just informational for everyone to know. With all the announcements I have at this time, at the proper time, our scripture reading will come from Hebrews chapter 13, and that will be read by Joey Durham. Our opening prayer will be led by B.J. Pettit, and our closing prayer by Jim Williams. And we will turn our worship service Oh, brother Don. Good morning, everyone. We'll be uh, singing There is a Habitation. This is a song about heaven, where we're all going. Oh, heaven. Talking about the habitation. Sing verses 1, 2, and 4. So glad to have everybody out today. God bless you. Oh, there is a habitation built. Training this morning will come from Hebrews chapter 3, 16, verse 16 through 19. Hebrews 3, 16 through 19. For who having for who having heard rebelled, indeed was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses. Now with whom whom was wait, now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose courts fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that 
they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey. So we, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Thank you, Brother Joey, for that scripture reading. Our song before prayer will be, I come to the garden alone. Verses 1 and 3. I come to the garden time we have to come spend with our Christian family, this time we have to worship you, we pray that everything that we do during this time will be pleasing, acceptable, and uplifting in your sight. Thank you for all the other many blessings, the ones that we can name, those that we might forget. Thank you so very much for all that you've given us. Pray that we'll always be appreciative every day. Thank you especially for your son who went to the cross and gave us a chance to have heaven as our home. Be with those who are sick, Brother David. Please be with them and help restore them to their normal walks of life. Be with us now through the rest of this hour and help us to keep our minds on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother B.J., for that wonderful prayer. We're about to take the Lord's Supper. And to prepare our minds for it, we're going to sing a song, Why Did My Savior Come to Earth? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Why did my Savior come to earth?
First, let me say good morning to everyone. The Lord's Supper. Jesus said, This ye do in remembrance of me. The word remember is a special word in the Lord's Supper. Remembering someone and what that someone has done for you is something that we should never, never, never forget. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus instituted this Lord's Supper, knowing that there were going to be bad things that was going to happen to him in order to fulfill his father's will. We know this by reading the book of Luke. The chapter is 22 and the verse is 42. Jesus' word, Father, if I be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. The Lord's Supper. The bread involves which Jesus the bread, the bread involved, which represent Jesus' broken body, and the cup, which represents Jesus' shed blood. The Lord suffered. Jesus says, "This ye do. This ye do. This ye do." In remembrance of me. Let's pray for the bread. Father, bless this bread, which represents your son broken body, and bless the one who partake of it. In Jesus' name, makes all these many blessings. It will overlook anyone. If so, let it be known by the rays of the hand.
Let's pray for the cup. Father, bless this cup which represents your son, shed your blood. And bless the one who partake of it. In Jesus' name, as all these many blessings. Amen. If we overlook anyone, if so, let it be known by the raise of the hand. The Lord suffered, Jesus said, did she do in remembrance of me? Give it. Giving is very, very important. Giving is something that we should look forward to doing. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 16 in the verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul wrote these words. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let every one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no, that there be no collection when I come. In so many words, Paul is telling us how we should give. Number one, we are told to give weekly. Number two, number two, it is to be done by every one of us. And number three, it is to be done based on how much one prospers. The purpose. It helps the church prepare for needs that arises, whether they be one time or over and one. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you will bless all who will give today. And show us your love in a mighty way because of our obedience. And Father, those who were unable to give, bless them also, that they will be able to give, that they will be able to obey your co commandment in the future. In Jesus' name, I ask all these many blessings. Amen.
earlier this morning when we received the call from Brother David about his hurting this morning. He does have a lot of pain in his voice because I was the one that took the call. He said, just can't make it. <clears throat> At that time, we were having to make decisions. and <clears throat> I called a couple of people and I called Ken McCurry. And he instantly told me, yes, Brother Don, I'll speak to the congregation this morning. It's a wonderful thing that we have members of this congregation who stand solidly on the truth and on the greatness of God's Word. And you're to be blessed for that. My brother Dalton called me up when we was on the way to church this morning and said, yes, I'll be glad to speak tonight. So it's a wonderful, beautiful thing that this congregation has strength. We also have enough strength to pray to God for David's behalf. So let's do that at this time. Heavenly Father, we ask you to have a special blessing with Brother David, that you'll strengthen his spirit and that you'll help him in every way, more especially his bodily needs. We pray you'll help him. Please help Kelly, who's there with him, doing everything that she can. Father, we pray that the ways and means being uh, planned out for him are good and that if it be your will, he'll be restored once again. Father, bless him and help him this day. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Our next song is Worthy Art Thou, and at the appropriate time, the invitation song will be Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow. <clears throat> Those of you who would like to at this time, if you don't have a baby in your arms, you can stand if you want to. <clears throat> Stretch your legs. So, worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer, worthy of Ken McCurry. Good morning. As always, it's it's a blessing for me. It's humbling and it's an honor for me to have an opportunity to stand before God's people. Because I know who you are. You are the saved. You are those who have trusted in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are those that believe in God, and you are those that are certainly seeking to do His will. I'm just saddened by the circumstances under which I am here. May God bless our dear brother in every way to help him recover. There's many different thoughts, many different things that we could talk about and dealing with uh, faith. I love the song that we just sang, Worthy Art Thou. The reason we are here, because Almighty God is worthy. Jesus Christ is worthy of our praise, our honor, our love, and our obedience. There are some things that I had been thinking about over the past several weeks and when Brother Don called this morning, I said, well, I've got some thoughts, but I don't necessarily have it in order. So I had, within a few minutes, just a moment, tried to put some thoughts into order. 
and it has to do with some things dealing with faith. There's a lot of controversy in the world, in the religious world, within denominations about faith. There are some questions I would like to pose. Don't know if we can sufficiently answer everyone to your liking, but we're going to try as best we can. Is there salvation in knowledge if that knowledge lacks understanding? If I believe in God but do not understand His directives to me, am I saved due to my mental acknowledgement of Him only? Is one saved based upon belief only without adhering to God's commands? What is the basis of salvation to any man since the cross? Well, what is faith? What or how does faith come? What does faith do? These are some things that there has been controversy over for a very long period of time. And the thing that, that interested me, especially about the scripture reading in Hebrews 3. For who having heard rebelled? Let's understand what's going on here. There were those that were sent out to spy out the land. What did they do? They rebelled. There were those that were not following God's plan. They rebelled. Many fell in the wilderness. Indeed, was it not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he, God, angry for 40 years? Was it not those who, get it, sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those, now here it is, who did not obey so we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Now, if there's any passage in God's Word that equates disobedience with unbelief, friends, this is it. And I cannot say, biblically speaking, that I believe and at the same time refuse to do what God has directed me to do. And neither can you. Neither can anyone. But isn't it interesting how many will try to do that very thing? What is faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us plainly what faith is. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In researching that word substance some years ago, here is the understanding of it. It's the undergirding part. It's the pillar underneath that holds it up kind of thing. The substance. Faith is the substance. What holds it together? What keeps it from falling? Faith is the substance of our hope. It keeps our hope. And we, we heard some things about hope in our Bible study area this morning. And what that hope does. And how we need to keep that hope. And to have a hope, we've got to have faith. And having faith, we should have that hope. Substance consists of all things dealing with the, that faith. And it's not just a faith. Now you and I can have a faith and, and talk to one another about, you know, a faith of a particular person kind of thing. But when it comes to the faith, there's only one. And if you ask someone or in a conversation, and you've heard it as well as I have probably, of what faith are you? Are you of this, of that? Are you of something else? Of what faith are you? The correct answer is, I'm of the biblical faith. For there's only one. It's the faith. It's the faith that we believe in. It's the faith in which we have hope, in which we trust. It's the faith. That's the reason we're here, 
because of the faith. Because we want to honor God. Romans 1 at verse 5. Through him we have received grace and apostleship. Get this. For obedience to the faith. Not obedience to a faith. Some faith. Your faith, my faith, his faith. But the faith. The faith among all nations for his name. Among whom you are also were called of Jesus Christ. Now there are those of stronger faith than others, maybe some of those in the Bible that were weaker in faith. Did the apostles not say at one time to Jesus, you know, increase our faith? There's many things dealing with faith, but the substance of it is what we believe based upon what God has given us to believe. And we believe in creation. We see the evidence of it. We have the inspired word of God. We believe in the evidence of it, the testimony of all those, of Jesus Christ himself, of who he was, and all the things that happened, all the miracles that occurred for testimony of the fact that Jesus Christ was in fact that Messiah that coming one, the Son of the living God. But can I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and still not be justified before God? Can I really do that? Romans 1.17 tells us plainly, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for in it the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So there's power in the gospel. And it says for all, anyone who believes. But what does belief do? Does belief obey or does belief disobey? Does belief take what someone says or does belief take what God says? How does faith come? Romans 10, 17 tells us very plainly. It doesn't fall out of the sky. I don't receive it in a dream. I don't receive it in a vision. And someone doesn't lay their hands on me and give me faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's book. God's word. The breathed word of God. The all inspired scriptures. What does faith do? Does faith obey or does faith disobey? Though one may not just come right out and say it. But yet the faith that they have basically says that faith disobeys because they deny the very things that God has laid before us and doing what God said, how he said, and for the reason God gave. That's the substance of it. And if we're not going to follow that, then we fall into that category as well as that category of those that we read about in Hebrews chapter 3. For they did not obey, they did not believe. Disobedience is unbelief, therefore, belief equals obedience. There's no other way to explain that. And why God has given us all that he has given us, and then think that, well, we can then pick and choose what part of it we're going to do, what part of it we're not going to do. And oh, Ken, wait a minute now. You're, you're, you're preaching works up here. Oh, we need to talk about that just a little bit, don't we? In Hebrews chapter 11, what do we find there? Oh, there's a lot of stuff to talk about in Hebrews chapter 11. What did they do? What did their faith cause them to do? Did their belief do something 
or did their belief do nothing? What was it by faith? Beginning verse 4. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Verse 6. But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. By faith Noah being divinely warned of the things not yet seen and moved with godly fear preparing an ark for the saving of his household. Verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place for which he would receive as an inheritance. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign land. By faith, in verse 11, Sarah herself also received strength. What do we see in each and every one of these passages? These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. That's that hope we heard about earlier this morning. On it goes. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. And who can stand and claim that they are preaching God's word and say that faith does nothing? That's not so, my friends. Faith obeys. A faith that obeys is a faith that is going to be justified before God. By faith, when? When does it happen? All of those things we were just mentioning, and there's more that we could read. But just because of time, I'm going to go to a few things here that will help explain some of this. How does faith work? By faith plus what? Well, John 3.16 says, you know, belief is it. Well, yes, but what does belief do? Is belief involved with the faith? Or is belief over there somewhere by itself that just, just says, you know, well, well, I believe, but I'm just not going to act upon it. Can we have mental assent only? That I believe there's a God in heaven? That I believe, you know, the creation was created by Jesus Christ himself? That nothing was made that was made except through him? Can I believe even that he's the son of God and then not do what God has given man to do to receive forgiveness of sins and think for one moment that God's just going to let me in? That's what's being preached. Maybe not in the words that I just stated, but that is the conclusion that is reached. That you can do whatever. Just believe that God is that Jesus Christ is his son and you're guaranteed salvation. And everyone's going to heaven, don't you know? Everyone. Have you ever, has anyone in here ever been to a funeral of anybody? Denomination, no religion whatsoever. Ever been to a funeral that they did not preach him into heaven? I haven't. And it didn't matter their life. Well, there's something behind that. I don't want to think of my loved one being in a place of torment. No one else does. But the truth of the matter is, and we don't want that so much, that the, the, the one preaching the funeral will, will be just so happy to console the family and let them you know, believe that that loved one, though they may have not even been religious, is somehow accepted by God and they had no faith. Or some other faith than what we read about in God's Word. These are some important things. We don't always talk about them in this manner. But a man of faith. If a man exercises faith, but his faith does not exercise him... Either the subject has a poor faith or the faith has a poor subject. One or the other. There are some...
passages here that I would like to wind up with, but this will take just a few moments. First, John 1 at verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. Okay, here's the question. How does a believer exercise the power to become a child of God? The next passage, Acts 11 at verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number that believed turned unto the Lord. What did these believers do when they turned to the Lord is the question. The next one. Repent ye therefore and turn again. Be converted. Turn again that your sins may be blotted out. According to Acts 3 at verse 19. Here's the question. What did these penitent persons do when they turned? Another. Hebrews eleven six, And without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Question, what does one who has believed do when he comes to God? Becoming a child of God does not consist in mere faith. For in the first passage, it is stated that the believer is given the power to become a child of God. One cannot be given the power to become what he already is is. Therefore, the believer as such is not a child of God. Turning to God does not consist in faith, for the second passage that I just read states that they believed and turned. That conjunction and ties the two together, but they're not the same. Believed and turned. The turning followed the believing. What was the turning act? Again, turning to God does not consist in repentance. For in the other passage that I read, the Jews were told to repent and uh, turn to separate acts. What was the turning act in that situation? Coming to God did not consist in faith. For in the other passage that I read, it also stated that one cannot, cannot come before or without faith. The coming, therefore, must follow believing. Then what is the coming act? What's the coming act? The turning in Acts 11.21 is not faith, for they believed and turned the turning act in Acts 3.19 is not repentance, for they were told to repent and turn. The coming act in Hebrews 11.6 is not faith, for they were said that one must uh, believe in order to come to God. So if one is saved at the point of faith, by faith without acts of obedience, then he is saved, get this, before he comes to God, according to Hebrews 11.6 before he becomes a child of God, according to John 1, 12. Therefore, the turning, uh, before he turns to God in Acts uh, 11, 21 and 3, 19. If one is saved at the point of faith, then he is saved without those things. The Bible order in these passages is the person who believed turned to God. The person who turned to God were pardoned. Hence, faith turning hardened. It follows just as certainly as night follows day that faith that saves is a faith that obeys. When you consider those that believed, there were those that believed but did not confess Jesus Christ. There were those priests that believed. They were afraid to be put out of the synagogue. They believed. Were they saved? They would not confess him. 
If you do not confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father which is in heaven. No, they were not saved, but they believed. So having knowledge of God's word is one thing. Having understanding of God's word is yet another. Having faith is one thing, but having faith that obeys is the biblical faith that is referred to the faith. That's the faith. That's the total picture. That's the totality of God's word. That's from the beginning of it to the end of it. From Genesis to Revelation. All that God has laid out for us to know. All that God has given us that we can know and understand his word. And knowing it again is one thing. Understanding it is another. Then knowledge, understanding, then should lead to that obedience wherein salvation lies. For is there anyone that would stand before God's people and tell them you are saved without obedience? But preacher after preacher all over this land and this world this day is doing that very thing. And how sad a commentary it is and how strong in faith we need to be that we fight against that. We tell people the truth. There's more to the story that they have not heard. The question is, who will receive it? Who's willing to receive the truth? For there's many false prophets gone out into the world. Many things are being taught. And it's sad to say that in some places in the Lord's church there's a lax of the truth being taught. Let it not ever be so at this place. May we always contend for the faith, stand up for the faith, not be ashamed of it, and tell the truth, though it may hurt someone's feelings. Do it in love. And the truth is, we must believe. We must have faith to please God. He has told us that we must repent or perish. He has told us that we must confess him before men. And there is a confession that one makes. Just as that Ethiopian made. That he believed that Jesus Christ was the son of God. But confession is a lifelong thing. We confess Christ every day of our lives. And we're not ashamed of the fact that our neighbor, our co-worker or the person in the grocery store line, know that we are Christians. Or we don't participate in the things of the world. We participate in things to deal with God and His greatness, His mercy and His love, all the grace that He has given us. And then following that, the faith that obeys is He that believeth. And is baptized, shall be saved. Do you believe that? Do you have faith enough? Do you have a faith that's willing to obey what God has given for man to do? To receive the greatest gift that could ever be given. Salvation, eternal life, joy beyond joy that exceeds any expectation that we could have. Believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized in the name of, by the authority of Almighty God, by Jesus Christ. For, not because of, for the remission of sins. That's the truth. It's in God's word. And it's plain English.
knowledge of it, the understanding of it. The only thing left is the obedience of it. Would you do that? Would you do that today? So that you can also then be among the saved. A child of God who obeyed based upon the faith that came by hearing the word of God. Or if you're one who needs prayers, if you're one who has stumbled in any way, and your faith has not been what God would have it to be for you, now is a good time to start anew. Won't you come right now, whatever your need, as together we stand and sing. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where Ken, thank you so much for a wonderful, powerful message straight from God's Word. Could you could you hear it ever any clearer than that? That was it was a great, great lesson. Thank you so much. The faith in action and obedience. Thank you all for being here. You are a beautiful, beautiful crowd. And as Brother David would say, there's no better place than you could be than right here at Lafayette Church of Christ. Thank you so much for being here. And especially if you're visitors with us, thank you so much. You know, one of the greatest ways that you can obey God is to be here this evening at 5 o'clock. Brother Dalton's going to have a wonderful message ready for you. It'll build you up. It'll help you out during this coming week. The other thing that you can do to have great faith is to pray for David this afternoon. Would you do that? Would you pray for him tonight, tomorrow, the next day? We have a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful preacher, and we love him so much. And let's pray for him. Our closing song is One Step at a Time. Verses 1 and 4, and then we'll have our closing prayer. Have a wonderful afternoon. God bless you. We love you. So, so, one step at a time, dear Savior, I cannot take any more. The place is so weak and hopeless, I know not what is before. 
got such a great manner in presenting thy word unto thee. And we pray that you would restore him back to as much as wanted help. Pray for all those, Father, that are in Ukraine and Russia. We pray that this conflict will end and may all of them get to go back to their homes. And Father, we pray that you watch over us now as we're about to be separated. Pray that you'll bring us back to the next appointed time, if it be thy will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 